Welcome to Halting Towards Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson, here with Greg Uttinger, our friend Brian Broom, and our new friend Virginia. Well, she's not new to me, but she's new to the podcast. Um, so do you want to introduce yourself, Virginia? Hi, everyone. I'm Virginia. I'm a scholar with a background in religious studies, history, and anthropology, with a particular focus in pagan religions, ancient and modern. Yeah. <laughs> what I would have been had I known what I was doing when I was in college. Anyway. <laughs> so we should all get along fine. Today we're talking about Upart's social theory and progress. If you're not familiar with the term Uparts, I can't blame you. I can't say I ran across it very often. Why do you think that is, Greg? Why don't I, why don't I hear about this? Why doesn't anyone know about Uparts? Well, they're out of place. Thus the <laughs> Uparts, out of place artifacts. They're out of place by the standards of modern science, modern humanistic evolutionary uniformitarian science, and therefore obviously don't exist or whatever people put forward as possible parts are hoaxes, um, mistakes, naivete. If we only got a chance to look at them better, they would go away. And, you know, sometimes that's absolutely true. Some of the things that have been put forward as parts over the years, time has kind of shaken them out and we've learned, okay, that wasn't what it looked like. But that still leaves an awful lot of stuff to talk about, even if some of it is still has huge question marks over it. As Christians, we're not surprised to see that there are things from the ancient world that are surprisingly advanced, uh, even for us. But in a way, that's a footnote to what we need to talk about tonight, which is sociology. Everyone says, yay, sociology. Yay. Yeah. Well, you know, I uh, I don't know about y'all, but I grew up in the, in the shadow of C.S. Lewis, R.J. Rushdoony, both of whom had very negative things to say about sociology. If you've heard that hideous strength, we get the great line where uh, the protagonist, Mark Studdock, says, well, in, in sciences like sociology, and uh, Inga says, there are no sciences like sociology. And he goes on to complain how if he found out that chemistry was a plot to take away from every Englishman his, his lands and his uh, rights, that he would give up chemistry and go... Judge Roses, and elsewhere, both Lewis and Rush Jenny warned that sociology is simply one more attempt to reduce humanity to things that can be manipulated by people in control, and thus uh, an outworking of basic Enlightenment philosophy. And I traveled along that road for a very, very long time, until at some point, I think it probably more than anything else was the writings of Malcolm Gladwell that caught my attention. Everyone knows Malcolm Gladwell, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We're not. All right. He's fun. He's a sociologist of sorts. And I began to understand that there are a couple sides to what sociology can be. One is you can go out and you look at a society and ask interesting questions and get interesting or boring answers. But the thing that's going to shape your questions and the framework in which you ask them and the framework in terms of which you receive your answers is eminently theological. Or more specifically, it's covenantal. When we look at sociology, we want to know what are the theological foundations of its culture? Who are its gods? Who is its God? What is ultimate reality for this society? How does that ultimate reality reflect itself, represent itself, communicate itself within the context of this society? And then what parameters for living does it set up? How shall we then live given <laughs> this ultimate reality, given how it represents itself here? And as we live this out, and, and this is some of what we want to talk about, is progress possible? Or is progress a non-given? Progress can't happen. We're stuck. We're stagnant. We're in the mire. And we're going no place because that's not a real category given our understanding of time and history. And then finally, and those questions are going to determine the last, what about the future then? If time is not something that offers us possibilities, then tomorrow will be like yesterday. And there's no possibility of progress. And that whole dimension of sociology gets wiped out as irrelevant and imaginary. And we, we 
we begin to ask, so what good are you then if you can't tell us what happens? It'll be more of the same. Well, we've lived long enough in the 20th, 21st centuries, 19th centuries to say, yeah, but that's not what's happened. We have seen real social change. So we're back to point four. Well, then what's the social engine that drives it? How do we have progress? And Uparts are just an interesting side note, uh, but we're on much firmer ground when we look at scripture. So I'd like to, I would like to look at scripture a little bit, and I'd like to talk a little bit about sociology and social theory and what civilizations can and cannot produce. And we'll go from there, I guess. What you just said reminded me of what the first conversations between Americans and Japanese were like when Japan first opened and started to trade information with the United States. And the United States wanted to know what are their exports, what they what can they produce, what's their economy like, as well as, you know, what sort of power do they have? And the Japanese emissaries said, that's funny, because we just came here to find out what you worship. That's what we yes. want to know. Oh, yeah, there's a story. You probably have all run across it at some point or another. When uh, Commodore Perry was ordered to open up Japan, he read every book he could on the subject, but still did not know much. But he went in with our new steel-plated battleships and cannon and sailed into to Tokyo and said, I want a meeting with your emperor. And they said, as if the emperor was a young boy who was playing around in the back of the garden of the palace, who was a mere figurehead at the time the shoguns, the warlords were in charge. And um, Perry um, released some cannon shots, and the Japanese said, that's not possible. We're the most powerful nation on earth. We are sons of God, or the gods. Who are these people? Where do they come from? We must know. And so Perry backed off and gave them time to consider. And when he came back, they welcomed him in. And they said, this, this nation, how could it possibly be excelling us? What is it? that drives them and have, has given them this, this kind of technological impulse. How is it that they, we, we, we talk to them a little bit, they win all their battles. How is it possible? Wait, what, who do they worship? They have one God. We have all kinds of gods. They have one God that unifies everything. And as long as they're serving him, they can't lose. And they have someone to blame everything on. We need one God. Okay, we'll start exchanging information. Meanwhile, excuse us, we need to make a God. And they created emperor worship so that they too could have a united theological basis. They took the emperor, boy, and made him a god. And then they established schools to teach the succeeding generations, this is your god. Follow him. We will be united. We will never lose. And as soon as they got to the point where they figured they had matched us in technology, they closed their doors again. World War One and World War Two were just over the horizon. So... Yeah, we're talking sociology, we're talking progress, and a podcast on theology and sociology and history. Interesting, isn't it? passage I would like to read um, is, uh, and there are a number we could pick. This is from Genesis chapter 4. I'll back up to verse 16. Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod on the east of Eden. And Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bare Enoch. He built it a city. And called the name of the city after the name of his son, Enoch. And unto Enoch was born Arad, and Arad begat Mahuchala, Mahuchala begat Methusael, and Methusael begat Lamech. Lamech took unto him two wives. The name of the one was Adam, and the name of the other was Zillah. And Adam bare Jabal. He was the father of such as dwell in tents, and of such as have cattle. His brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of all of such as handle the harp and organ. In Zillah, she also bare Tubalcain, an instructor in every artificer in brass and iron. And we could go further, but that's a good place to stop. This is seven generations from Adam, and we have metallurgy in brass and iron. That's not supposed to happen. There is no secular timeline that allows for that possibility. And yet the Bible mentions it in past, seemingly in passing. We can wonder about all the things it didn't say because we wouldn't have understood what in the world it was talking about. But every civilization, every major civilization since then has known what iron and brass are, and has had some concept of either how to do it or, or the knowledge that our neighbors over the hills that know how to do it, and we boy, we wish we did too. But this is a technological level that is not far from that of ancient Greece and Rome. 
and here we are seven generations in, and the flood is still a few hundred years off. And the question becomes, what did they do with those few hundred years? What happens when you have the people who invented the wheel, the lever, fulcrum, carts, axes, hammers, mining, metallurgy, music? <laughs> What if you have people of that brilliance all living at the same time, all probably within communicating distance of one another. And living for hundreds of years. And living for hundreds of years <laughs> and accumulating knowledge. What happens when they still have three or 400 years left? What are they going to do with that? Uh, the answers could be shocking and possibly frightening. God doesn't tell us. It's obviously not crucial to the gospel narrative, but it is something to think about and something to consider in this whole realm of, of sociology. Because, and this this is the, the question I get from students all the time, these are the bad guys. Why are the bad guys getting all the good technology where the good guys apparently are herding sheep? Hmm. Aren't, aren't, aren't God's people supposed to be all about dominion and, and developing the world? Where are they when... The bad guys are going exponential with their technological developments. And this, I think, is, is the focus of what we're talking about. Why, how do the godly make progress? How do the ungodly make progress? What's the difference? And what do we do with that today? Well, uh, I wanted to jump in and mention in the second that you're talking about in Genesis, in the kind of medieval Jewish a mystical background in Kabbalism and and so forth, uh, where you have the idea of the Nephilim and what have you, and more specifically the Watchers, this group of evil angels who come down and they're the ones who lie with the human women. Again, this is the, the medieval um, kind of occult Jewish perspective. Specifically, they bring down metallurgy, medicine, magic. They're the ones who teach mankind those mm -hmm. things, sort of citing at least um, the historic attitude that this came out of nowhere, not that it was developed by human imagination, mm -hmm. but that it just pops up and we don't know exactly why. And so we blame it on the angels. <laughs> <laughs> I love the blame it on the angels part. That's great. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, yeah. Can we blame everything on the angels? <laughs> because of the People angels, try. we have to cover our mm. hair. So uh, because of the angels. <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh, where was I going with this? Uh, yeah, you say this is um, out of uh, Jewish mysticism and out of medieval thought. Open any random evangelical commentary on this chapter of Genesis, and guess what? <laughs> You'll get <laughs> exactly you get. the yeah. same thing. Blame it on the angels. Mm. Uh, I, I didn't want to spend a lot of time there. I still don't. But I think in passing, we should at least note that that doesn't work in terms of the flow of, of the story and the theology here. Man has fallen into sin. God has stepped in as redeemer. He's given a promise. Cain and his line have rebelled against the promise. The question then becomes, what happened to the faithful? And to suggest that they were, well, as you say, we can all blame it on the demons, the angels, because they came in and corrupted everybody. It does not answer the question. It's one more, well, the serpent beguiled me, and mm -hmm. that, that's, that's not the nature of the thing. What happened to the seed of a woman? What happened to those who claimed the promise? And as we look forward along the long line of covenant history, we see that there are two things that happen over and over and over again. When Satan can't, well, first of all, Satan would love just to kill all of God's people. God rarely gives him an opportunity to even come close. He, he has on a few occasions. But when that doesn't work, Satan's, Satan has two motifs. One, get God's people to worship idols, and then God will destroy them. Or two, get God's people to marry pagans who will then lead them to worship idols, and then God will destroy them. And you can think of Solomon. You could think of uh, at least twice in the Restoration Era. You can think of, oh, just you go through the history of the kings and, and, and kings of Chronicles. This ongoing thing, uh, Jezebel's daughter Athaliah, 
yeah, let's marry Jezebel's daughter because that's good geopolitical sense, right? <laughs> Guess what happens? We get Baal worship and we nearly lose the messianic line. So this is this is the first of an ongoing pattern that continues to this day. As a school teacher, one of my chief harping points is, guys, young people, you have to marry a Christian. You're a Christian, you got to marry one. This is not optional. This is not something you think about. And let me define Christian for you, please. It's not the guy who shows up at youth group a couple times because, oh, that's where all the hot girls are. That's that's not <laughs> it. We need to think covenantally and spiritually here about what a true Christian is. And, and, and this ties in. What happens? What happens when, say, a godly man, it can work the other way, we'll just pick this one, if a godly man marries a very intelligent, creative, non-Christian woman who is not simply, she's non-Christian, but she's self-conscious enough to know that, no, I don't believe in your God, I don't believe in your Jesus, but we're going to be, we're going to marry and we're going to make this work. What happens to the child? What happens if the father pours all of his energy into training the child and disciplining the child, whereas the mother, and again, this can work either way, it can be father, mother, mother, father, at every point is questioning the faith. What you can get, and our generation has seen this, well, my generation saw this over and over again. You get people who are very well self-disciplined, trained, intelligent, understanding math, science, logic, literature, history, politics, economics. They may spend some time in seminary. They may end up in the army eventually. And sooner or later, someone decides to give them tons of power and they become leaders of major nations. Think. Lenin, Stalin, Hitler, Castro. These guys, by and large, were products of the church, but without the faith. They had the self-discipline to, to do a great deal, but they lacked the faith. And the church can spawn its own worst enemies by this kind of compromise. And assuming that's what happened here, we, ha we have this, this uh, ungodly line that's percolating along, pursuing technology at the cost of purity, sanctity, the Sabbath, the, the Bible's prohibi prohibitions against slavery, its insistence on family life and church life. That's all getting trodden underfoot. But we're making progress. We're making money. We're absorbing territory. We're, we're all together. And then it begins to fall apart. And God's people look across the valley and say, oh, look at those girls. They're so cute. Let's go marry some of them. And we rescue the pagan culture, the apostate culture. Quote, That's rescue. Unquote. Rescue. Yes. Well, we're going to go be good. We're so is, heroic you know. and noble. Yes, we are. <laughs> but what we get is that kind of thing. You have this very, you have, you have this society that has, a, that has all of the capital of a Christian civilization, the discipline, the moral training, the responsibility, the, hey, I make my bed every morning like a good soldier. I can follow orders. I can give orders. I just hate your God. And that's really, really dangerous. And so by the end of those 300, 400 years, with the flooded hand, the godly have vanished. There's only eight people left. In fact, the scripture actually says there's only one left, and that's Noah. Noah alone found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So here's some more thought, some grist for the sociological mill. What does your faith, what does your ultimate commitment to God or to something else due to your understanding of society and how that society will operate and whether or not you believe that progress is possible. Let me uh, let me throw out a couple terms and then we can kibitz some more. Let me distinguish, and these are my, not wholly my terms, but I will use them this way and you, you can adjust if you need to. A pagan culture is one that does not acknowledge the God of the Bible, has not for generations, and does not acknowledge his word. It, ha it lives in terms of its own set of presuppositions, and it may be on a wide continuum from we're sitting here with some technology and some spiritual capital left over from our great-great-grandfathers, but um, the universe is God. We're kind of some kind of pantheistic people worshiping our little manifestations of God in the, in the idols and the brooks and the trees and whatever. Uh, and we we protect ourselves with magic, and we're still using technology. We're using magic. Hey, I feel like I'm in Star Wars. And uh, but 
we're, we're stagnating. We're not really going anywhere, nor do we believe we can go anywhere. The, the end of that continuum is uh, we are a people who live out in the bush. We have no technology to speak of except maybe some sticks and some some fire. <laughs> Uh, Coke we have, bottles we, that fall from the sky. Exactly. Yeah. Um, we. I mean, that's that's changes our universe. We don't have any of that, and this is what missionaries have been encountering for the last couple hundred years or so. But we do do. We know magic. We know demons. We know the spirits, spirits of the ancestors. We know the taboos that shape our culture. We know we may not violate them, and we know that this thing you call progress, change. No. 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 The demons get you when you do that. Do not change us. We will not change us. Uh, you say if we if we chop down that tree, our lives would be better. Uh, no, that tree stays forever. The tree has always been there forever and ever. It will be there forever and ever. That is the way of our father. So this this is a, these are the extremes of a pagan culture. Over against that, an apostate culture. An apostate culture is one that a generation or two was Christian or godly, and believed in the God of the Bible, uh, understood His Word, understood His moral law taught it to their children, developed a culture in terms of that. And then one day they say, wow, look at all the cool stuff we have. My right hand hath gotten me this stuff. I know no, I don't need God anymore. God was a nice uh, safety blanket once upon a time, but we can now control our own destiny and we kick God out. But we still have that spiritual capital, again, self-discipline, work ethic, believe in a real world where science actually works. The technology of a previous time, and we still have a belief in progress. We still believe that we can build on this, but that doesn't last forever. And the question of how long it lasts is a matter of historical studies. So, where, for example, does say ancient China fall, where we have the discovery of gunpowder and the the building of the Great Wall? I don't know the timeline on either of those things, so I ask this question out of ignorance. Well, I, I'm not a Chinese scholar either. I have a vague idea of some of the timeline. My my guess, and that's all it can be, anyone else is free to, to jump in here, is that we are dealing with a pagan culture that hasn't done the slide yet because it hadn't confronted the gospel yet. God is far more patient with cultures that have never heard of him, have never heard the gospel, have never heard of Jesus. He tends to let them sit there and percolate along for a long time. But China, you, you would think China has all of these advantages, movable type gunpowder and all the rest. Uh, and then there's even talk now of, of her sending ships out to explore the world about the time our Renaissance started. And some people are arguing for connection. Or I haven't looked into it. I don't know. But China did not change the world. Christian mm -hmm. civilization changed the world. There was a limit on what China could accomplish given her pantheistic worldview or animistic, or however you want to describe it. With Confucius, it was more of an atheistic worldview, set over a polytheistic world, pantheistic worldview. So it's not a hard and fast rule that these societies will never invent something while they're still viable at all. It's when you get down to cultures like, well, the Ich, someone wrote about them back in the 70s, or uh, anyone ever read Peace Child? I'm familiar with it. I have not. It's on my list. Okay, read Peace Child. You, we, we come upon a society that it, it echoes with something that sounds like maybe the gospel or, or historical revelation lingered on, but they got nothing. They got cannibalism. They've got internecine warfare constantly. The greatest virtue in that society was to be able to convince your enemy that you were his friend until you can get him to let down his guard, and then you kill him and eat him. And if you can do that, you are super cool. Mm -hmm. And so when Don Richardson, the first missionary to the Sawi people in Papua New Guinea, uh, came among them and, and mastered the language enough to begin to tell them the gospel story, he, he went among the men and said, this, let me tell you about this Jesus. And as he told the story, they were polite, bored, listening, as you do to an honored guest. But as he got further and further into the story, into Passion Week, they be, their attention began to perk up. And Don thought, wow, I'm getting to them, getting to them. And when he got to the point of the betrayal with the kiss, they all expressed incredible admiration and excitement. And they and they said, wait, this, this man, this Judas, he was a friend of your Jesus? Well, yeah. He, he, he was a close friend. Yeah. 
He 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 stayed with him for three and a half years. Yes. And then he betrayed him with a kiss? Yes. That is so cool. We want to be just like him. <laughs> Backfire. Um yeah, and John Richardson's question to himself is how can you possibly reach such a culture with the gospel when treachery is an idol? And you have to read Peace Child to find out. God God had provided a way. But that, in my mind, is, is pagan culture that has run its course. It's a retrograde culture. It's the kind of culture we, we've talked a little bit about cavemen before. That's where that ends. When people have so abandoned, and I keep using the word a lot, but it's it's intentional, self-discipline. They can't take care of themselves. They can't brush, they won't brush their teeth anymore. They won't take baths. They won't go out and work for eight or ten hours. You you eventually get a civilization that is wholly given over to superstition. And that opens the door for the demonic. And in the absence of the gospel, what missionaries have found is that the demons still still show their eyes in the twilight when we're not careful. The shadows move when you're not watching. So that's that's some of what we want to continue to talk about. When you come to ancient Greece and Rome, you find that there is very little notion of progress. By and large, history is cyclical. It came out of chaos. It arises, it springs into some golden age, which then declines through silver, bronze, and iron, falls back into chaos, and through some ritual, like the Saturnalia, some chaos festival, uh, where morality is completely abandoned, we we return to our basic the basic chaos that that is at the bottom of the universe. We regenerate the culture, and it pops back up, and it does it all again. In uh, in Aristotle, it's a little more. He of course was always a little more rational and scientific. His idea was that history keeps moving in circles over and over again. The reason we don't we don't remember is because every civilization so thoroughly destroys itself that we have no record. We just forget them. But wow. yeah, <laughs> so encouraging. Yeah, well, that that was the pagan mindset. There was nothing to look forward to. Well, let's take it back a step. Think of the gods. The gods beget their their children. What do the children always do to the mm -hmm. gods? They overthrow Kill them. their parents. They overthrow their parents. And whether you're talking Cronus against Uranus, or you're talking Zeus against Cronus in Egypt, you're talking Isis against Ra. Uh, in uh, Scandinavia, you're talking Loki against Odin. We all know that one because we all watch Marvel. Uh, and, and you <laughs> range throughout the uh, the world. The children devour their parents, even if the parents try to get there first. Now, one of the incredible things here in Christian Christian thinking is that God begets his son, and the son does only those things that please his father. He is the perfect image of the living God. The brightness of the Father's glory, the express image of his person, and in his Son, the Father is well pleased. There is no loss. There is perfection. There can You can move from the fountain to the river and lose nothing. And it's also worth pointing out that the difference between true religion and false religion is also the difference between God's eternal begotten son and the son of the morning it makes a lot of sense that false religions they're a little bit like um satanic fan fiction <laughs> <laughs> essentially everything is the same you you know the first god it comes out of the chaos and the secondary god that's generated from him says, "Wow, you are awful and I'm going to be better than you and I'm going to I'm going to overthrow you." And that's basically what Satan's view of uh -huh. the cosmos is. Yeah. How yeah. derivative and unoriginal. Ah, uh, yes. Uh, 3 out of 10 stars. <laughs> <laughs> um and, and 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 so exactly, in the doctrine of the Trinity, we have the possibility of hopeful eschatology. The end can match the glory of the beginning. In pagan theology, there is always, as Brian says, this immediate decline. And I think you're absolutely right as to where it comes from. The story of the gods rising out of chaos and them turning on one another. This, this is more or less Satan's version of what actually happened. Satan believes that Yahweh is, is a product of the universe. Well, he knows he didn't, Satan knows he didn't create himself. 
He knows he didn't create Yahweh. So Yahweh seemed to be there first. The only possibilities are he is what he claims to be, in which case Satan absolutely has to obey him or bad things are going to happen. Or Yahweh's lying, which is what he suggested to Eve. He's just another cosmic force, another god. He woke up sooner, got there first. He's playing a mass con job on the universe. And Satan's here as our deliverer to suggest that maybe if we join the rebellion, we can bring God down and assert our own autonomy. We can be as God's deciding for ourselves what's good and evil. Which is specifically what the Gnostics taught. Exactly. Exactly. But in terms of social theory and in, ter in terms of eschatology in particular, the Gnosticism is a dead end because the universe having the cosmos, the material creation having having gotten here, uh, that was a bad move. We, we, we need to undo that. We need to go back where we began because the step out from God was the fall. The creation of the material universe was the fall. Whereas Christianity says, no, the creation was very good and Jesus came into it to secure and redeem it. And he made himself part of that creation by taking to himself true human nature, true flesh. And, and, and so this, this step into history by the second person of the Trinity shows that God has not given up on the universe because the universe is not the problem. The physical creation is not the problem. Time, space, and matter are not the problem. The problem is the sinful human heart. But God can fix that. And that's the story of the gospel. And so when we come to St. Augustine over against pagan culture, St. Augustine writes The City of God. And what he does after discussing why chance is a dumb idea and why fate is a dumb idea and why these don't work, <laughs> he basically goes on simply to tell the Bible story. Okay, here's God, he made the world, and he just walks through the Old Testament history all the way to Jesus and then tells that, gives an idea of what's happened since Jesus came and then jumps to the end of time and says, this really happened. We're not talking myth. We're not talking legend. We're not talking some kind of upper story, upper category experience. We're not talking connotation words. These are true historical events that happened in true measure time. We can give you dates. And the whole Testament contains an extensive chronology where we can pin things both to a calendar and to a map. So this is it. This, this is what happened. And it's God that moves it. He began the story, and it is a story. He moves it to Jesus. Who's the point of the story? And from there, Jesus moves it to the judgment and the resurrection and the end of redemptive history, but not the end of everything. It's, as Lewis would said, the end of one story and the beginning of the new story that has no end. Every chapter is better than the one before. But this idea of story now comes to the fore. And, and this has as, as many applications for literature as it does for understanding and teaching history. Uh, we, have, uh, we have a beginning that includes a setting and an atmosphere and major characters. We have the original problem. We have the plot complications. We have the development of history through those complications to the coming of the hero. We have the climax in the death and resurrection of Jesus in the name of law, particularly in the book of Acts and the epistles and Revelation. And then from our point of view, that seems like such a long time. <laughs> but in terms of what God was accomplishing, the story the hard part's over. Jesus won the battle at the cross. And so that history is now the outworking of that permanent, 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 I can't say it, victory. And, 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 and thus the gospel saves history and makes possible the development, the growth, the sanctification of the church. And as we've talked about before, but the sanctification of the church always has to take place. The sanctification of any human soul takes place in the context of a real world working with real stuff. Mm -hmm. This history test I have to pass. This piece of technology that I keep slapping to get work. This, <laughs> this bill from the IRS. This relationship with the girl who's supposed to be my very best friend. You know, we, all these things are real things that we deal with on a regular basis. And those are where we get sanctified, whereas we come against the problem we confess our sins. We call upon God for grace. He empowers us to get through them, shows us in his word what we ought to do in response to them. We grow, we become stronger, greater, purer, but always filled with sin in this life. But that this growth that's maturing extends on to eternity. And so if that in doing these things, we 
grow the universe with us. We, 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 we weed and, and, and sow the garden until it becomes a city. Brian? Just to point out, it, the Christian walk and sanctification, they're not, it's, this isn't an, an Eastern idea where you go to a mountaintop somewhere mm-hmm. uh, to get as far away as possible from other people and from the earth. There is a reason levitation is a common motif. You are separating yourself from the earth itself mm-hmm. in search of greater enlightenment. That's not the Christian view of sanctification because you're you're dealing with other people, other bearers of God's mm-hmm. image and other I know I'm stealing this phrase from someone and I can't remember who it is, but That's other okay. enfleshed beings. Like mm-hmm. they, they have bodies, they are bodies and they're, yeah. they're people. It's not something esoteric or yeah. or Gnostic. separated. <laughs> Gnostic. Exactly. It's it is something very, very practical and real. And even even things that aren't image bearers will be used for your sanctification. Like you said, this weird thing that you keep slapping <laughs> to try and get to work. This yeah. darn a, motorcycle it it. <laughs> run. It doesn't have a soul. It doesn't bear the divine <laughs> image, but you know, it can test your patience and <laughs> the Lord can use that too. And yeah. as we wrestle with the creation, we improve it. That's what we're called to do. And, I, and as I said earlier in an earlier episode, I think sometimes we've missed the point and thought, well, what God really wants is an improved universe. Well, he does, but that's secondary. What he wants is an improved us. He wants to look at humanity and see his image. He's producing a bride for his son. And that process will include creating a better place for her to live, the earth, the new earth, the redeemed earth. But what we, I, I think we miss the point, and I think uh, Reformed theologians have often missed the point, by treating the dominion mandate as one thing and the Great Commission as something else. And we're supposed to do them both or not, or we argue. I think once we see that they involve each other, as Brian just said, you, you, you don't grow in Christ, you don't grow in grace, you don't become more and more the image of God by going up on a mountaintop and meditating on your navel. <laughs> you do it by laying hold of the hard things of life and dealing with them. And in the yeah. process, we assume, make the world better because it can be better. That's a theological category. You know, the Middle Ages struggled as, as they as they read Augustine, they struggled with this idea of progress. And it became more or less clear that, that such things were possible. There were, despite what the uh, Renaissance and Enlightenment scholars tell us, there were a great many technological breakthroughs in the Middle Ages. But it was with the Reformation when um, theologians said, wait, the church is bad. It can be better. We could reform it. Well, if we can transform, or if God through us can transform the church, if the church can change significantly for the better, if we can reform worship and church government and church doctrine and the creeds, then doesn't that mean that other more mundane stuff can change too? And whereas Luther wasn't so sure about that, Calvin in his better moments was pretty sure. And then along come the Puritans, they're absolutely sure. <laughs> you know, they're looking at the latter day glory of the church, the dawning of the millennium in history, at least for a generation or two. And they 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 held that forward. And it became not only the impetus for Massachusetts Bay Colony uh, and for the um, the Puritan stand in the Civil Wars, but a couple generations later, as their writings resurfaced, it became the, the impetus for the great missionary movement of the 1700s and 1800s. People read these books and said, you, you mean we can win the world for Christ? Why aren't we? Let's go do it for the glory of Christ. And uh, it wasn't until dispensationalism set in that that trend began to die off. As long as there was belief that what the prophet said and what Jesus commanded was a real possibility sociologically, eschatologically, the church prospered when the church became convinced that, no, we're that Jesus is coming back next week. We're done here. Uh, missionary activity took a very different direction. Let's go in and win a bunch of people real fast because, you know, clock's ticking and, oh, did I say that next week? I meant like we got five days. I mean, Jesus is really, really, I lived through that generation. You guys didn't for the most part, but you all remember Harold Camping, right? Oh, yeah. Yep. Mm-hmm. I remember yeah. Harold Camping. Yeah. 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 We had... <laughs> I think we had a school dance that day. (laughs) 
<laughs> we had a couple of young young people in our church who were just absolutely convinced, and and they mm. they bailed on us. Oof. And we, what, what what will happen if you find out you're wrong and Jesus doesn't come back? Well, I, I guess we just have to live with that. But that's not going to happen. And they they vanished in the wake of that. Mm. They gave they gave up. What, what you believe, you know, people ask, is eschatology really that important? Well, if you mean, is it a salvation issue or one we should divide fellowship on? No, of course not. But how important is psychological warfare? How important has it been in the 20 and 21st centuries? How important is it to get your team convinced that they're going to win? Uh, we pay people thousands and hundreds of thousands of dollars to do that. It's kind of important. And God wouldn't talk about it if it weren't. So question, you know, when we're talking about the Christian view of progress and as we're, uh, you know, moving through those different social movements uh, that really pushed missionary work and, and what have you, there's also the lead up into the social gospel movement, which mm -hmm. is where we end up getting temperance and basically sure. the modern progressive party, which tends to not be super Christian in, in uh, a lot of its <laughs> aims. Um, and beyond that- Mild understatement. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and beyond that, you also have, you know, within communist ideology, both in Europe oh, yeah. and in Asia, whether we're talking Russia, China, or uh, less so Vietnam, but this idea of the perfection of society sure, and man. Absolutely. The utopianism. Correct. Yeah. yeah. Well, notice where that comes from. Notice the Enlightenment, compare it with the demise of Puritanism. We step directly from the Puritans giving up in the second or third generation, Salem Witch Trials and all that, halfway covenant. At the same time, the Enlightenment is springing into existence. I just finished a book called The um, the Heavenly City of the uh, 18th Century oh, Philosophers, I yeah, think. Yeah, you've talked about this book. Yeah. Uh, the argument, was it's it's put forward by a, oh, I don't know what, I guess he's a historian, who, who lived just before World War II. He was so proud of humanism and atheism <laughs> and rationalism. And he looked back on people like Rousseau and Locke and that whole crowd with their naive optimism and their, their borrowing Christian ideas and Christian capital. Why couldn't they just be consistent and admit that if there's no God, then none of this really works. But, you know, it's okay because look what we've got anyway in World War II, which is just around the corner. Yeah, look what we've got. But there was, in early Enlightenment thought, this extremely optimistic belief, stolen directly from Christianity, that, that said, we can make progress. These, uh, the argument of this, this book is, at least part of the argument is, these guys could not give up the idea of morality. They dismiss God, but they believe that in doing so, they would make the foundations of morality more solid, having removed it from what they perceived as superstition. It would now be grounded in something much safer and more sure, man's rationality. The problem was they had trouble figuring out exactly how that worked. And they, they kept insisting, and even when the, when the Enlightenment began to fragment, there would be one wing saying, atheism means no values. The other side was still saying, no, Atheism, it ensures our values somehow. We're sure it must. I mean, the whole point of this was to show men that they can be good and they don't need God. They can just be good. We're not sure how it works or why it's, and why it's failing and why you're yelling at us. But, but really, it does. Work. And you look at Rousseau and you look at Locke. Hobbes is a little different. But, <laughs> a little different. But there is, and in, in, in the French Revolution, nobody stood up and said, there's no God. Let's all kill one another. They were demanding, insisting on the possibility, the reality of liberty, fraternity, equality, or death, the other part of the slogan we always forget about. Mm -hmm. But they, they thought they could do it, yes. And as that part passes over into Marxism in the next century, that, that optimistic eschatology is most certainly there. I recommend it to you all, um, Francis Nigel Lee's book, Communist Eschatology. It's a mile thick, with more footnotes than you want to read or look up. <laughs> But he deals with this at, at, at length, why this was inevitable. Uh, also, to a lesser extent, Gary Norse, uh, one of his first books, um, oh, what's it called? Revolution or Chaos, something like that. It's a, it's a book on, on Marx. And he, yes, he traces down this very thing. But here, here's the, you know, you look back at the, at the late 20th century. What do we got? We've got scientific humanism, 
we've got New Age occultism, we've got Islam. What do these things have in common? Well, they all have a predestinating factor that it, it ensures victory, that ensures we're going where we want to go. We, they all have a way of representing themselves in history, whether it's a scientific elite, the political party, the guru, the reigning uh, imam, whatever. They all have a set of rules, whether it be the planks of the Communist Manifesto or the Quran, or the spirit speaking in my heart, and they all have means of, of progress whether it be you know the the inevitable passing into the age of Aquarius as the stars align, <laughs> or whether it be the inevitability of successful jihad, or whether it be this is where evolution is taking us, it's coming, trust us. And consequently, they all held to some sort of optimistic eschatology, which is so completely at odds with traditional anti-Christian pagan thinking. They ripped us off. They looked at Christianity and said, <laughs> Here are things that make a worldview work. We will now secularize them or paganize them and take them, and we will have a world-conquering faith. And you know what? They all came awfully close. Meanwhile, Christians were sitting back and saying, we don't believe in the sovereignty of God. We don't believe in an infallible Bible. We don't believe in God's law. And we sure enough do not believe in a regenerating spirit who can bring about the kingdom described by the Old Testament prophets. Just don't. And so in the late 20th century, the, the major worldviews that were contending, Christianity was not one of them, except by God's grace. You just look at the playing field. We were the losers. And only God's grace kept us in the game. Because none of these worldviews could sustain themselves because it was stolen material. And they necessarily began collapsing on one another. They haven't collapsed completely, for sure. But the process has begun. It takes a consistent worldview rooted in the triune God of Scripture to maintain any kind of hope for progress, any belief that tomorrow can be better than today for the generations to come. All right. We are running out of time, so we're going to transition into recommendations, which I'm not sure I warned you about, Virginia. Um, <laughs> I'll so roll you don't have to go first. <laughs> Uh, my recommendation, because it, uh, it wasn't what I was originally going to do, but it fits in well with what we've been talking about, is a book. I have this thing about recommending books. Eventually, I'll get to recommending old sci-fi TV shows or something. But for now, <laughs> um, Millennialism and Social Theory by Gary North. Millennialism and Social Theory. So we were talking about social theory. This ties it to eschatology and to what the various theologies of eschatology within the Christian church for the last 2,000 years, what how they tend to react to history, what kind of impact they have on history and culture, uh, given a long view. It's anyone with a college degree will not find it terribly difficult to follow, I don't think. Yeah, so there's, there's mine for tonight. And next we have... So... This is going to be uh, much more frivolous in comparison, um, but I am going to recommend that if you can find a Nashville hot chicken restaurant near you, you should go do so because I just went to one uh, this past weekend with some friends. Do it with friends. Make make it a, a group Everything's outing. Everything's better with friends. Everything is better with friends. But I went to this place in uh, in the Sacramento area that was very good and humor they had different spice levels for you so there was like mild for people like you know my mom who can't handle spiciness at all uh but your mom's so spicy her wit definitely is uh she makes up for it all the way up to i forget i think it was called i can't remember what they actually called it i know the second most spicy was called extra hot but the most spicy one had a uh, description next to it that said, please sign a waiver. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so but what's, that, the name of it, what's the name of it again, Brad? Uh, well, it, the yeah. style is Nashville hot chicken. Okay. Um, sandwiches, basically. The, the one that I Wait, went to. So how does it compare to Chick-fil-A, the Lord's chicken? <laughs> that is a, a very good question. I would say that it's hard to compare them because they are very different for one chick-fil-a like their spicy chicken sandwich it's just a chicken sandwich that has a bit of spice to it it is not the yeah. same thing as a nashville hot chicken sandwich they're just they're just worlds apart it's hard to compare them at okay. all 
But I one really of them sanctifies it. your soul as you eat. That is true. <laughs> wait, wait, this is heresy. <laughs> what is going on here? <laughs> no, no, no. The, the chicken comes pre-blessed. <laughs> Yeah. You should still pray over it for your own sanctification, but it is pre-blessed. Yeah, one one of the uh, churches near ours uh, announces on its bulletin board once a year, "Come for the blessing of the animals." Oh no, I don't know. If chicken mm. fillet brings its chickens on that day or not, but anything's <laughs> possible, I guess. Probably not. I've only ever seen. <laughs> animal blessings from like Episcopalian churches or PCUSA and I'm pretty sure <laughs> play is a, a thoroughly Southern Baptist yeah. like they, there's no yeah. uh, so once again there. we have this idea that your theology does shape your culture down to what you eat <laughs> and ah, how you treat is. your pets it's so true. We, we, we experience yeah. this as a, as a matter of daily reality we just don't always see the broader implications. see my recommendation still ended up being on topic so oh, there you go. still yeah. theology Oh, as she says, yeah. we talk about everything along the way. So yeah, there it is. Let's go, let's go so for it. That's my recommendation. So, Eat at a Nashville hot chicken restaurant. Sounds good. Virginia, how do Anglicans treat their pets? Uh, we treat them generally well, although I will totally confess that much to my disapproval, the whole uh, blessing of the animal thing has trickled down and it's not my favorite. <laughs> but... oh. I'm sorry. I mean, maybe our pets are just better than yours. I don't know. but <laughs> oh. Anglican oh. pets are the best. Yes. Apparently. yes. <laughs> exactly. Mm. Emily, do you have a recommendation for us? I do. Um, I I know I've t talked about or at least mentioned Andrew Peterson before. Um, he's a singer songwriter um, and a Presbyterian, like a good Presbyterian. Not like <laughs> I actually didn't know Ooh. that. Yeah, he's OPC man. W wait, really? For real? So is Stephen Curtis Chapman, but we don't talk about him as much. Um, <laughs> I feel like my entire reality has just been shaken to its yeah, core. That's yeah, so I just cool. Like I, I no shifted idea. into an alternate dimension. Anyway. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, the OC Supertones are also OPC, which oh, is yeah. pretty rad. I did know um, that one. Yeah, but I keep coming back to this one album by Andrew Peterson called <laughs> Counting Stars. It's just so good. Like, I first listened to it years ago, and, like, I learned all the songs, like, I know them. I can sing all the words. And so I stopped listening to it. And then I listened to it again. And it's still good. Yeah, <laughs> it's remarkable. It's sort of meditation on his family, um, his struggles with his wife. There's one song where the story behind the writing of it is they had a fight. And he walked away and was going to write a song about how wrong she was. <laughs> and the song that came out is called Dancing in the Minefields. <laughs> and it's not at all about how wrong she was. <laughs> um, but you should listen to the album Counting Stars. Virginia, do you have a recommendation for us? I do. I, I in a pinch, can't come up with something uh, that is on topic, hopefully. So my recommendation is a book that I read a couple months ago called Ren Red Shambhala, Magic Prophecy and Geopolitics in the Heart of Asia uh, by Andre uh, Jaminet Jaminensky. Uh, hopefully I got that part right. But it basically covers the uh, right after the Bolshevik Revolution, there were a couple of movers and shakers within Russia who thought that, hey, if we can figure out this whole Buddhist thing, maybe we can make the perfect communist citizens. Like they are, we'll get them enlightened and they'll just be calm and peaceful and do whatever we tell them to do. <laughs> uh, which, Have they you know, heard of the history of Asia at that point, like at all? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, also, it, you learn a lot of things about Buddhism in particular. Um, Tibetan Buddhism is it, like American conceptions of Buddhism is very much like, oh, it's so peaceful. No, no, not, not <laughs> at all. Um, the patron uh, goddess, because also contrary to American perceptions, Buddhism is not a atheistic religion, particularly. But one of the, the Buddhist uh, patron goddess of Tibet is uh, this woman who supposedly you know became a convert to the faith and she was so... Um, intent on showing her devotion that she skinned her son alive and she's always depicted riding on a horse with her the skin of her son as the saddle blanket beneath her holding skulls like it's oh my goodness welcome to buddhism ah. in central asia so this goes into that a little bit but mostly it's about the russians trying to infiltrate 
the the uh, you know Dalai Lama's palace and what have you, um, <laughs> with with various and sundry odd things that happen along the way in Mongolia. Uh, and there's also an American who is a part of the Theosophical Society who gets involved. So it's interesting. It's really niche history, but uh, if, if that thing floats your boat, it'll be right up your alley. What is this? A crossover episode? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> So do they actually talk about the legendary Shambhala or is it just thrown out there as a cute title? No, they um, definitely do. So part of it was basically one of the Russian um, tactics in Central Asia and uniting. So the white Russians, when they were escaping, holed up in lots of uh, the Transbaikal and Mongolia and what have you. So that was where their stronghold was. The red Russians were trying to make sure that they got the native people on their side so that um, they would stir up nationalist tendencies. And part of that was, especially in Mongolia and Tibet, using the Shambhala legend where there's supposed to be a savior who comes out of the north and will lead them to Shambhala. And so they're like, hey, we're from the north. That's us, guys. <laughs> um, this will be great. The whites also tried to do this. There was a guy, um, the Baron von Ungern, who's known as the bloody white baron. Um, and he was also in the trans by call and, and he tried to harness that legend as well. Uh, mm. So it, it's, it definitely gets into that and it kind of draws some distinctions. You'll pick up a lot about uh Again, Mongolian and Tibetan Buddhism, not necessarily going to carry over to Chinese and Russian or excuse me, well, mm-hmm. uh, Chinese and uh, Japanese and, and Indian Buddhism, but uh, the more Central Asian variants. So now that I'm really like confused fun. because the road to Shambhala is a song by Three Dog Night. And the name Three Dog Night comes from an Australian idiom, which is not in the north. So <laughs> what's this? What's going on there? I don't get it. <laughs> Shambhala is just the idea of a hidden kingdom where everything is perfect that you're trying to okay. find your way to. And the idea in Buddhism is that eventually there will be um, the king of Shambhala will come out from hiding and basically conquer the world and make every. It's it's very similar to the Mahdi in uh, Islam. Basically, there's lots of conqueror messiahs <laughs> running around. <laughs> Yep. I wonder why that is. <laughs> anyway, thank you all so much. This conversation has been too short. It is delightful. <laughs> so thank you all for being here. Love to join you all. Thanks also to David, our producer, and my lawfully wedded husband. All of the books that we mentioned, as well as probably some cultural references that I catch in our review, <laughs> will be in our show notes, which you can check out on our website, which is anchor.fm slash halting towards Zion or on whatever podcast catcher you find us you'll find our show notes uh, you can send us an email with your input your reviews your questions your random opinions about anything halting towards Zion at gmail.com and we hope to see you next week thanks <laughs>